Welcome to this, the fifth of Renew's six Green Rebuild Toolkit webinars. Tonight's webinar topic is water storage and fire resistant landscaping. The purpose is to, to cover how rainwater systems and landscaping can create a more drought and bushfire resilient home and to discuss key design considerations for rainwater systems and landscaping, landscaping decisions. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We encourage you to share in the chat the Aboriginal land from which you are joining us tonight. Also, we acknowledge that it is possible something you hear may be emotionally challenging for you. We encourage you to reach out for support if this occurs. One resource is Beyond Blue. They are available 24 seven and their number is 1300 22 46 46. That's 1300 22 46 46. Now to some housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. There are a couple of webinar functions we encourage you to use tonight. The chat function is on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Simply click on the icon to use the chat. It would be great if you haven't done so already that you tested the chat function by sharing with others where you are reaching us from tonight. Next, the Q&A function is on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Similarly, click on the icon to open the window, type in your question and press enter. You can also upvote questions by pressing the thumbs up icons. I'll now give you a brief introduction to the toolkit which sits behind this series of webinars. The Green Rebuild Toolkit is a project from Renew a member-based nonprofit organization who have provided Australians with expert independent advice on sustainability since 1980. Renew also publishes two leading sustainability magazines, Renew and Sanctuary. Through this work, Renew has worked directly with designers, architects, and sustainability experts for over 40 years. The devastating bushfires of 2019-2020 prompted Renew to share some of the expert resources that have been collected along the way. And so the Green Rebuild Toolkit project began. It is intended as a platform to share Renew's expertise, to amplify other projects and people doing good work in this space, and to share stories of those rebuilding. The toolkit can be found online. It is divided into eight sections that walk readers through the process of rebuilding. You can read it chapter by chapter or jump to sections that interest you. Throughout it, you will find expert feature stories, buyer's guides, and case studies. There are also many links to external resources, which you can find in the blue boxes in the margins. Importantly, the toolkit is designed to grow and evolve. If you know of a project that you think should be included, or you would like to share your own rebuild story, please follow the links on the website. And now to tonight's program. We have three speakers tonight. They will each speak for approximately 10 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A, responding to questions you have posed in the Q&A function on your screen. I'll first introduce myself and then our three panelists for the evening. And I'm sorry if you've been with us for the previous four webinars, not because the, you came to the webinars, but I'm going to say the same thing over again tonight for those who are new to this program. I live in far eastern Victoria in Malakuta, a remote coastal community profoundly impacted by the 2019-20 bushfires. I've volunteered for years in efforts to grow community and regional re resilience. I'm coordinator of the Melakuta Sustainable Energy Group, a member of the Friends of Melakuta, and I present two weekly programs on 3MGB Wilderness Radio, our little volunteer community radio station. The first is from Little Things, where I celebrate the little things that happen in our community and in the outside world. 
The second is healthy conversations where I chat with the local doctor about all manner of issues relating to our community members' health and well-being. I also run Carbathon Consulting, a small practice where my focus is nurturing resilience, helping individuals, organizations, and communities create sustaining futures. I particularly like helping others develop their skills for living responsibly and responsively. Remarkably, since my husband and I moved to Malakuta 11 years ago from North Warrandyte in Victoria, in the bushy northeast of Melbourne, our daughter, her husband and two youngsters, and our son have also moved here. We were all here on New Year's Eve 2019. We chose to defend our daughter's property and to prepare the other two as best we could and leave them to whatever occurred. The fires came very, very close to both our homes, but in no small part due to neighbors and emergency services, our properties were not lost and the defense of our daughter's home was also successful. 123 other families in our small community were not so fortunate. Our town has established a community-led recovery association and COVID willing, our plans for recovery are continuing to emerge. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker is Anthony Power. Anthony is a registered landscape architect and senior bushfire consultant at Covey Associates Consulting Engineers. He has tertiary qualifications in bushfire science, urban planning, landscape architecture, natural resources, horticulture and arboriculture, and eight years of practical experience as a volunteer firefighter. Anthony specializes in fire behavior, modeling, and risk assessment. He has a keen interest in fire weather, green fire breaks, and the role landscapes can play in minimizing bushfire risk. Anthony will give us an overview of landscaping for bushfire, focusing on smaller blocks, but his considerations, but this, but has considerations for larger blocks also. Next, we will hear from Mark Burton Walter. Mark has been a volunteer firefighter with the CFA since 2004 and has worked there since 2018 as a land use planning and bushfire assessor. Prior to working at the CFA, Mark was in the building and construction industry and was formerly a building designer. Mark has experience in bushfire and structural fire firefighting and is passionate about community safety and fire prevention. He sees himself as, a, as fortunate to work in a role that combines his building industry and firefighting experience to help support the community to be fire ready. Mark will discuss water resources on your property for fire defense and access. And lastly, we will hear from Chris Ferreira. Chris has been a leading high profile exponent of sustainable land management in Western Australia for the last 25 years. He is the director of the Forever Project and specializes in innovative education programs to inspire and empower people from all walks of life to lead more fulfilling and sustainable lives. Since 2015, he has developed the Fire Rescue, Resilience and Recovery Program based on his Heavenly Hectares Program, which in 2005 won an FESA Community Behavior Change Award. Through the Fire Resilience and Recovery Program, they have developed some of Western Australia's first demonstration firewise landscapes and Australia's most comprehensive firewise education and behavior change program. Chris will discuss the Forever Project's firewise program and firewise landscapes. Now, before Anthony begins, I'll just remind you that all three presentations will run first and then we will have a Q&A discussion with the panel members. If you want your question to be included in the Q&A, please make sure that you put it in the Q&A and not in the chat. And now to our first speaker, Anthony. Hello, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Great. Okay, I'll just pop on my slides here. Um, welcome everyone. Um, hello, I'm Anthony Power. Uh, I'd firstly like to yeah, respectfully acknowledge the Kabi Kabi and Jinnabara traditional owners of the land on which um, I'm sitting 
and to acknowledge the elders both past and present. Okay, um, I'm here to talk a, a little bit about landscaping and bushfire prone areas and I have got quite a few slides to go through um, with quite a lot of images. Um, but what we're going to cover is bushfire attack. It's important to understand how bushfires do attack houses and leads to their um, destruction. And then we'll run through a few landscape design principles and some case studies. Uh, but the first thing that I'd like um, people to try to understand is the bushfire attack. So um, there's four main ways that bushfires do attack houses. Uh, the first one is um, direct flame contact. So if the house is close enough to bushland and it can come into direct contact with the flames that are emerging from the adjoining vegetation. Uh, the bushfire front also expels heat um, in the form of um, main convective heat and radiant heat and a bit of conduction, but radiant heat is the one that um, plays the biggest part in um, house loss. Uh, the other attack is uh, wind and ember. And so ember attack is probably the most important um, in terms of um, the number of houses that are lost in Australia and overseas each year. And it counts for 80 to 90% of house loss. And we'll look at some examples of that. So embers can create secondary fires um, around the house, which um, can then make contact with the house, et cetera. So on the photo on the on the right is from the uh, image from the Perugian fire. Um, and there was quite a lot of Melaleuca communities adjacent to Perugian uh, Beach. And you can see the ember density um, that is uh, involved in, in the attack on the, the suburb of Perugian Beach. It's, it's quite, quite heavy. Uh, here's an image of um, ember attack um, in California. Um, so you'll notice um, that in this aerial photograph, uh, there's uh, three houses which have been destroyed, uh, but the remaining sort of area is pretty green so it's, and largely intact. So the fire front hasn't actually moved and directly contacted the, these three houses. It's embers which have bypassed the break, landed on the houses, either accumulated and caused the loss of the house or started secondary fires um, and causing their destruction. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a little bit of fire scarring down in the landscape. So that's probably the direction of this particular fire. So, so a few useful design questions. So just putting your landscape designer hat on and then thinking about that in terms of the bushfire attack mechanisms that we've just sort of ran through. So remembering uh, that's direct flame contact from uh, fires emerging from the adjoining vegetation. So your forest or heathland or grassland um, even, or shrubland. Um, and, and then looking at that from a design perspective when you're designing your, your, your gardens around in your house. So some, these are kind of useful questions that yeah, I run through. So first one, should my landscaping catch fire, will it th threaten important assets? So that could be um, your house, obviously, or garages, outbuildings, sheds, that kind of thing. Um, am I placing large amounts of fuel or flammable material near these assets? So we'll run through some examples of those. Uh, am I creating a path, fire path from the hazard bushland to in these important assets? Uh, am I restricting fire authority access around them? Uh, can I design to impede the progress of a fire? So we'll have a quick look at how that may happen. Uh, can I use less flammable materials? Can I help shield important assets from radiant heat? Can I help catch burning embers before they impact important assets? And can I help with first aid firefighting? So that leads into the provision of water, that kind of thing. So we'll run through another few ways um, that um, houses uh, can be damaged or, or lost. Uh, so falling trees and poles. So you can see some examples here uh, where the fire front has moved through, burnt all the fine fuel and the coarser woody material is, is still burning. So you see these the trees on the left, uh, they're burning at the base and then typically bushfires or bad fire weather is associated with strong winds. That's impacting on, on the trees and they have a tendency to fall over. Um, the other thing that happens is if the soil is particularly dry, the fire will actually go underneath the soil and burn out the roots, causing them to be unstable and the trees can fall many hours or even days 
after the actual fire front has already passed. The thing happens with fire poles. So you can see on the right hand side uh, that uh, uh, that uh, that power pole is um, sort of leaning. So this is a few of the different types of fuels that we typically encounter in the suburbs or around houses. So all these things are pretty or can be considered combustible or flammable. So you have the mulches. Um, different mulches will perform better than others. Um, shrubs and fences, uh, trees, obviously. Uh, cars uh, can um, ignite um, the tyres, um, grease, and parts of the chassis can all catch fire with embers heavily impacting them. Uh, timber retaining walls um, is a particularly important one. We'll go over that briefly. Things like compost heaps, uh, sheds, particularly if they have things like petrol and fertilisers uh, in them, and then things like outdoor furniture, umbrellas, um, doormats, anything that's sort of hanging around uh, the house. Uh, piles of firewood uh, is another one. Uh, there's an image here of relatively uh, good um, landscape design, just isolated trees, uh, low mown grass, kept fairly green, um, which is all helpful. And there's just an interesting little quote down the bottom. Uh, so in the 2003 Canberra fires, uh, Ellis and Sullivan, who are two eminent fire scientists in Australia, concluded that it was likely that more than 50% of the houses losses in the Canberra fires were due to attack from suburban fuels. So that's all those things we just covered, actually catching fire uh, from embers or other impact from the main fire front and then uh, impacting on, on the houses and the fire uh, moves through the suburb. So in the Wye River fire in Victoria, they, they did some extensive post-bushfire surveys. And one of the key findings from that particular study was that pine retaining walls are a big no-no. Um, so that's even thinking about pine retaining walls that I've seen on fire and even the ones I've had in my house, they tend to only last 10 to 15 years and they start breaking down, becoming rotten, um, and when they get to that state, they're very easily ignitable and they burn for a long period. So the duration of the fire attack, if these retaining walls are next to a house, can be for hours. So just imagine um, a pile of sleepers burning right next to your house for a couple of hours. It's potentially going to do some, some damage. So plants obviously is... Um, uh, another important one, and the species selection can be important. So there's all sorts of different characteristics, which I won't go through here because we just don't have time. Um, but leaf fineness um, and the amount of moisture that is retained uh, in that particular plant um, is of importance. So in the middle photo there, you get the the um, uh, fleshy kind of leaves of the hymenocallus um, plant with the spider plant with the, the white flowers. Uh, that's obviously not going to be as flammable as euxanthary or grass tree on the right. Um, another important thing to note with your plant selection is if they do become stressed and you have dying, have, or this, the plant starts dying because of drought, which is often associated with bad bushfires, you do end up with quite a lot of dead material. Um, so even in this bracken fern that you see in a um, bushland landscape, you can see underneath the green fine leaves is a lot of dead, dead material. So removing that um, in times of bushfire um, danger period is important. And the gum tree leaf, it has a lot of high oil content and are very flammable, which we all know about, this picture down there. Uh, another important thing about plants is their bark. So um, the bark um, encourages vertical movement of fire um, into the canopy of, of the trees and up the, the trunks, and also dislodges quite a lot of the bark material, which then becomes burning embers which then can impact uh, a house. So stringy barks are generally regarded as, as the worst. So you've got a picture of a tallow tree there on the left. Um, paper barks are also pretty nasty. Uh, ribbon barks, also bad um, and can be responsible for long distance kind of spotting, but it's kind of another thing. Uh, but the best ones are smooth bark trees, like your rainforest trees typically have, uh, and tight bark. So that's Pipe bark photo was of a um, Araucaria tree, which is like a Norfolk Island pine or a uh, hoop pine. Um, so 
Um, the other guys will probably run through this a little bit too, but with landscape design, um, we want to create a defendable space. So that's a space in which the fire authorities or residents can safely battle spot fires, which are going to be created around in and around the, the property due to ember attack. Uh, so on the right, you have your hazard where the flaming fire front is going to come through and will typically last a couple of minutes as the fine fuel is consumed um, by the fire. And then it moves through that outer zone and typically it will subdue. Um, so if it was in the canopy, it would drop down to the, the ground. Um, you still may have flaming material coming out of that and it can go across the inner protection zone, but at a far less intensity if, if these spaces are designed right. And also there's sufficient distance uh, between the hazard and the asset that um, people or firefighters can operate safely. So sometimes that's not always possible due to block sizes, et cetera. But if you're operating in that as the fire front emerges, you could be subject to um, significant amounts of radiant heat and it, you know, critically so, and you may not be able to sustain being in that space um, until the fire front has passed. Um, but ember attack can occur well before the actual fire front arrives and well after. So being able to operate that in a level of radiant heat that's acceptable um, is important. So the mitigation work can occur, which is putting out spot fires. So here's another example of some defendable space, large areas of mown lawn. Uh, the trees don't have branches which are close to the ground, so there's not the ability for the fire to move up into the, the canopies very easily. Uh, just briefly on water tanks, um, so this was a bit of a study um, on different types of water tanks undertaken by another famous fire scientist in Australia called Justin Leonard, and he uh, worked out uh, that unsurprisingly really that um, concrete tanks are the best and most resilient, um, corrugated ones next best, and polyethylene tanks not so good, so they can actually fail and, and rupture if they're subjected to flame and um, significant amounts of heat, as that image illustrates. Um, it's worth touching on windbreaks in context of landscape design. So windbreaks can be quite a benefit if they can be placed such that they don't become part of the fire attack on a house as well. So that means they need to be placed sufficient distance away from the adjoining hazard. Um, but they do reduce the wind speed uh, behind them, which means that uh, fire behaviour in behind the windbreak isn't erratic, um, embers don't um, move as far, um, and they can also act in filtering out any embers which are travelling towards a house. And they, those windbreaks need to be um, signed with the right species, so they're not easily ignited themselves um, and can capture as many embers as possible. And just to illustrate the effect of trees and wind reduction on uh, fire behaviour, so you can see um, there's a clump on the right-hand side of a few trees, and the fire front, this is a grass fire in, in this example, there's a flank of the fire, the left flank, um, has really slowed down, and the flame heights are well reduced, and as the distance increases to the left away from the trees, uh, the fire behaviour then uh, gets more excited and the flames get larger and the rate of spread, etc., is increased. So one of the things that we can do to impede um, fires is what we call ha-ha balls, um, which is an English landscape which was used back in the day to keep sheep within different paddocks and probably still used in different parts of Australia too, actually. But if um, they have uh, rock walls or retaining walls, then they can help uh, impede or break up um, a fire which is moving, moving through a, a paddock. And they also offer a bit of radiant heat protection, which that little diagram illustrates. Uh, fences is a really important aspect, particularly in between houses which are, are close together. Justin Leonard um, has done a lot of the work on bushfire house attack and destruction, um, did this experiment as well. He belongs to the CSIRO. Um, so different fences which are typically found in the urban environment are pine paling fences, hardwood fences and colour bond. Uh, and from this image you can see colour bond definitely fares the best. Um, it's non-combustible. It provides significant amount of uh, heat shielding. So uh, behind that, that fence, um, there's uh, 
a far less amount of radiant heat. So firefighters can move up and down in between houses where there's a, a separation fence, which is the colour bond fence. Pine paling fences, on the other hand, um, are quite porous. Um, they ignite pretty easily. They're drying out as the drought sort of continues. Their fuel moisture content becomes very low. Uh, and the fire, as you can see from the image on the right, just moves straight through it. So, um, And that can uh, impact the house if it's only one and a half metres away, particularly. Um, and also it loses structural integrity and then falls on the house. And then it's another um, type of attack. A quick study. Um, this was a, a house that was lost in 2020 in Bateman Bay. So image on the left is before the fire and the image on the right is slightly zoomed in of the house um, after its destruction. Uh, so you can see the, the, the ground is pretty much unburnt. There's no obvious fire scarring uh, in around the adjoining blocks, but the gardens themselves have obviously been burnt. So um, this has happened through uh, ember attack. So the house may have been lost by direct ember attack on its structure itself, but what also could have happened, and judging by the, the burn scars, is that the garden has uh, caught fire and a fire has boo through the garden um, and then up next to the house, particularly on the right-hand side. So there could have been direct flame contact from the guard, from the fire moving through those gardens and impacting the house. And if that wasn't defended, uh, then there's a good chance that that could have been the cause of the house loss. So finally, we'll just run through a couple of good and bad designs. So um, this is uh, a little design that um, my team knocked up uh, for this presentation. So what we can see here is a, the forest on the left-hand side, separated by a fire trail. Uh, you have the house in the middle. Um, and there's a lot of fuel uh, from those examples that we ran through right next to the house. So you, you have gardens which are directly adjoin the house, and they're particularly bad news if they're under vulnerable elements of the house, like windows or next to decks. Um, you've got a wooden deck which is facing the... Uh, forest or the hazard side. There's a pergola full of vines, um, tim raised timber, um, pine timber, veggie beds, um, bins, uh, which are right next to the house, all elements which are flammable sheds, uh, again, right next to it. And there's a pool which is on the, the leeward side in terms of the bushfire attack. So there's some no-nos, heavy fuels on, on, on the the left-hand side so the fire can just move straight from the forest into those gardens and towards the house there's a direct fire path uh, there um, to the house. This one, um, you can see a clear separation around the house of non-flammable materials like pathways. Um, everything's the same in the other one in terms of the same elements, they're just arranged differently. So you have the pool um, on the the fire side, um, any decks are on the other side. Um, the deck on the left-hand side has been replaced with a, a patio. The pergola and the vines are gone. Uh, the veggie patches are a little bit further away. There's good access and a link to the fire trail. Um, there's a bit of a green break on the left-hand side to infiltrate any uh, embers, which might be coming away, which they would uh, be. The bins are separated, the sheds are further away. Uh, and we don't have any uh, large trees overhanging uh, the house, which can become like these ones uh, up on the left there, uh, which can become significant sources of, of ember attack. And they also drop leaves everywhere and fill up your gutters and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but probably gone over a little bit, but I'll, I'll leave it there and happy to answer any questions at the end. And I'll uh, pass it over to Mark from CFA Victoria. Thank you. Thanks for that, Anthony. Uh, that was very interesting, especially regarding the um, uh, tree of pine um, sweepers for retaining walls. Um, that is a, a fairly common feature that um, can, can present quite a, uh, quite, a, quite a risk. So I'll just share my screen with you.
Okay, so um, I'm Mark, I'm from Country Fire Authority in Victoria. Um, so I'm gonna look at, uh, we're gonna look at uh, water supply and bushfire resilience. Um, I'll start with uh, the information that I'm gonna to talk to tonight is, is sort of related to planning, um, but it will be fairly general in nature. Um, reason being, I'm in Victoria, I'm very familiar with the Victorian planning scheme. Um, there may be uh, similarities across states, However, um, there, there, there may be differences. So it's always best um, if you discuss with your local fire authority or responsible authority council, um, or engage a bushfire planning consultant or a planning consultant to discuss what might be relevant uh, to, your, to your situation. Um, as I mentioned, um, most states will generally have a requirement to provide a static water supply for firefighting purposes um, in areas at, at risk of bushfire. Um, Bushfire resilience is is, effect, is a system. Um, it and one of the most sustainable things that we can do um, is reduce that risk of bushfire to life and property. And to think of that system, we look at the the siting and design of a building, um, the construction standards. So you may be familiar with um, a bushfire attack level or BAL. Um, that. Um, vegetation management, um, as, as Anthony has, has, has discussed, uh, is, is quite crucial to it. Tonight we're going to look at uh, access and water supply, and, and, and these two uh, very much talk to each other, and, 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 and one, one is required, um, as is the other, to, to, to make um, that part of the resilient system um, quite effective. So the more robust we can make these, these elements of the system, the, the greater the chance you have uh, to reduce the risk of building loss um, or serious damage um, during the passage of fire. <clears throat> uh, unsurprisingly, uh, water is their primary uh, fire suppression tool. So ready access to a suitable supply um, for yourself and, and for the fire brigade is important um, in the protection of life and property. So the Royal Commission into the 2009 Victorian Black Saturday uh, bushfires found that there was a higher rate of uh, house survival where water was available uh, on the property and was gravity fed because both mains and uh, water and water pumps will often fail um, during a bushfire. Um, for obviously for, for, for various reasons, it might be a very high demand um, on, on, the, on the system itself. Um, it might be water for a reticulated system, water has been diverted elsewhere um, where it might, uh, might be needed. Um, and, and, and pumps do do fail, especially in, in, in more regional um, and rural areas. So most houses damaged, uh, and as Anthony touched on, most houses damaged or destroyed uh, were ignited by wind-borne embers rather than from direct flame contact. And that ability to put out um, spot fires did greatly increase the, the likelihood of a, um, fire, of, of a building surviving. However, on days of high fire danger, uh, leaving early is, is always the safest safest option. So what we can consider for, for operational and planning considerations. Um, capacity, there may be uh, requirements, planning requirements, uh, or even building regulation requirements for capacity. So how much you need to, to meet the planning requirements could almost be thought of as the minimum required. Um, you, you should think about the, the, the risk that broader landscape um, may pose. If, if you're impacted by a bushfire, will there be sustained ember attack um, from bush further away? So you might not be uh, necessarily directly impacted by a, a flaming front uh, or fire itself, but it might be um, from ember attack from a bushfire further away. Um, Will you need, in more remote areas especially, will you need to be putting out uh, spot fires for several hours? Um, quite often, uh, access is, is, is cut off, restricted. Um, you might be there if you are, if you don't leave early and, and you are there or you, you, your plan is to, to stay and defend. Um, you might be there for a very long time without any support. So will you have enough uh, water on hand to, to continually put out those, those potential spot fires or, or fires around the house. Um, so 
the greater the capacity, the more water is available for a brigade as well. Um, and the better chance you have, you're, you're going to have enough water to last that passage of fire. So from an example is, is over 2019-2020, uh, uh, the East Gippsland fires. Um, I was in, in, in an area in East Gippsland. I was, I, my crew was tasked to defend a, 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 um, a motel. I looked around the property and I found three or four very large, about 10,000 litre uh, water tanks, static water supplies with brigade connections. Considering there was very limited water in that area and we were up on a hill, um, knowing that I had that amount of water uh, potentially on hand uh, made me quite confident. We, we would be able to defend, successfully defend uh, that, that, that property and, and give ourselves some protection as well. If we're thinking about how we could be uh, a sustainable um, so we, we could potentially combine a water tank. So we can have our uh, water for firefighting, 10,000 litres. In this instance, we're looking at a 35,000 litre um, tank. And you have uh, your domestic water as well uh, in the same tank. We can do that by locating uh, the, the outlets at, at different heights so that you make sure that you can have that reserve um, for firefighting. And that's a minimum, the, the way that it's shown uh, on the screen at the moment, the, the firefighting reserve outlet, anything below that is, it can't, is not going to be considered in, in how much water we have on site because we can't access it, it's below the outlet. So that, that is one thing to bear in mind, but potentially you can combine um, those, those two systems. Um, you, you, from that, you, you're reducing costs, you're reducing uh, embodied energy to, to produce the tank, to transport the tank, to get it to your site, and, and those, kind of, uh, those kind of considerations. In Victoria, um, we don't specifically say it can't be connected to, to stormwater. So from that, it, it can be connected to stormwater um, it, it, or rainwater systems but you best to check with local requirements. Uh, and that initial tank, tank fill should be, it might not, you might not be able to wait for the downpour to, to fill the tank. You might need to actually have the tank filled so that you, as soon as you're in, you, you have that water on hand. So our next consideration is uh, the location um, of, of, of the tank itself. So during a bushfire, um, even in more urbanised areas with reticulated water, we can't rely on that, that supply being available. Said pumping facilities might fail or it might be diverted. So it's important you, you can access uh, that water safely uh, if you need to. So consider the likely direction um, that a fire will approach and if possible, site the tank so that the fittings are shielded so that they face away from those directions um, or from those aspects. So that can also provide a level of protection to firefighters as well. Um, if, if we're using that tank um, for asset protection um, on, on, on your property or, or assisting in the area. Um, and ideally, uh, it, if you have been through the planning process and you have um, defendable space or you, you've landscaped as such, um, it might also be called an asset protection zone. Um, it, it's, it's always best to locate that tank within that area, um, that area of management, so that there is, uh, is a level of, of, of safety uh, included in that as well. Another consideration is if the brigade does need to access that tank, um, how are we going to do that? So in Victoria, uh, you need to be within four metres. We need to be able to get within four metres of, of that tank. Um, in other states, it might be a bit, a bit more, it might be a bit less. And the reason being, we use uh, what's called a suction hose to, to access that water, and we carry a very limited amount on, on, on the appliance itself. So the further away we are, we might not even be able to, to access it. Orientation of the, of, of the outlet as well um, is a consideration. Um, it might be within four metres of the access, but it might be perpendicular, uh, in which case we might not be able to snake the hose around. It's, it's a fairly rigid hose. Um, so that, that, that should be considered as well, how, how will the brigade access this water? Um, it should be readily identifiable. When you see on the screen, um, we have a, um, a, a marker, a triangle. Uh, this should be ideally at, at, the, at the entry of your property, so we can see it, and on the tank itself, so that we can identify it. Because obviously, 
Uh, there are many uh, tanks, um, especially uh, said in rural areas like where I live, um, where it might be confusing or you might not know which, which tank is actually intended for, for firefighting use. Um, the other consideration is that the remote, the, the outlet should be um, gravity fed. There might be potential to use a remote outlet. Um, so you, you might have the tank in one location and the, the outlet to in another location. Um, that would need to be downslope um, effectively of the, of, of the, the tank or at the same level. Um, so that that, wall, so that, that that outlet itself um, is what we call flooded, so that we can see by opening the outlet itself, water will come out. We know that there's water in there and the brigade can, use, um, can access that. Another consideration is, is access, and I, I have touched on it before, um, but it's, it's also for occupant use as well. It's not just brigade use. So can you get to that, that outlet safely? Um, if you can get to it safely, then most likely the fire brigade will get, be able to get to it as well. Um, and it, it, it you, you needs to be in a location, as I said, that, that ha, preferably within the defendable space, within an area of management um, that doesn't have flammable objects around or near it, so that should you need to get to it in an emergency, you, you can do that um, relatively easily and relatively um, safely. Thinking about the environmental impacts of it as well, um, looking at the materials. So non-combustible, um, as again, as Anthony mentioned, um, the, the studies done by CSIRO and, 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 and Justin, um, we, we will generally be concrete or, or steel, corrugated iron, that, that, that kind of material. What, which, which is the more effective? So a bit of a search around, a um, bit of research, I found that um, steel um, has a lower embodied energy and, and that sort of cradle to grave consideration um, as opposed to concrete. Um, and it might be easier to recycle at that, at that end of life um, as well. But you would need to consider manufacturing transport costs, um, especially when you're, you're in more remote areas, when you think about that embodied energy. So that, that's something to keep in mind um, and it would need to be suitable for your site. Another consideration that really isn't um, spoken to in, in the planning scheme is our sprinklers. Now, good quality sprinklers, um, well-fitted systems can help protect your property against ember attack. On their own, they're, they're not a reliable solution to bushfire risk. Uh, there are standards that they, they would need to be designed and, and installed to, and that's AS5414. Uh, and from that, there's a minimum water supply of 22,000 litres. Uh, it does need to, to operate for a certain amount of time, and there are calculations for that. So again, it's a consideration. Um, it, it's, it's, it would be part of that, um, that resilient system, but on its own, um, it, 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 it's not as, as effective um, a system. So as part of an overall strategy, absolutely, it could be a consideration. So talking about appropriate um, siting to enhance resilience, what we, what we have here is, is three locations. Now, again, for Victoria, all of those locations meet the planning, planning requirements. Um, so location A, uh, at the top of the, top of the page, um, it's within 60 metres of the dwelling. So that's, that's, that's good. Um, Again, 60 metres, it, it's, it's based on the length of hose that we carry on the truck. Um, that's effect, it's, well, that was about two lengths of hose. So we, we should be able to, um, to, to defend um, that, that property if need be. But, and the outlet is within four metres of the, of the access way. And there's even a turning provision um, for us as well at that location. But it is outside of that defendable space area um, that you can see in that lighter green room in the house. It is closer to that hazard vegetation. Um, if, if, we assume, if we say north is up the page, which it, it, I've shown it as that, um, in Victoria and south, southeastern Australia, typically, our, our highest risk aspect is the um, northwest and the southwest. Um, in this instance, that vegetation is to the northwest. So it's close to that hazard vegetation. Um, 
and it's potentially dangerous and impractical for, for occupant use. So while it might meet the planning requirements, it doesn't necessarily meet those, those practical and those operational and safety considerations um, I've discussed in the previous slide. So if we look at location B, it's within the defendable space, which is a tick. Now it's within four metres of the access road for brigade use, and again, another tick, and there's also a turning provision there. Uh, in, in this instance, it's, it's a court bowl. Um, it's shielded from the likely um, buyer approach, which is again to the northwest um, and to the southwest. We have a road that way, so there's, there's a bit of mitigation already. It's away from that height hazard vegetation. It's identifiable. Um, potentially, you, you could see that from the road, um, which as a, as a firefighter, I would see that. Uh, it would give me a level of comfort to know that that was there. Um, and I would be able to know that if, if we had to defend that property, oh, well, we, we might have water there as well. Um, and it's a convenient and, and reasonably safe location um, for occupants to access as well. So that's a, that's a fairly, uh, that's a quite a, a good, good, well-considered um, position to enhance that re uh, resilience. So if we look at C, um, again, the outlet's within four metres of the access. There's a turning area nearby. Um, it's away from that hazard vegetation and it is readily identifiable. Um, again, you quite easily see that from the road, but it's outside of that defendable space and it, it's quite a distance away from the house. So it might not be practical um, for, for occupant or, or brigade use. So there, there are some of the things that we can consider um, when thinking about what we could do to enhance that resilience. Um, it's not a tick the box type operation. It would be, it, it is always site specific. Um, but it does form part of that, that overall uh, resilience um, uh, puzzle, I suppose. Uh, and, and the more robust we can make that, uh, and that could be your siting and design, um, the location, the vegetation management, all of that works hand in hand to improve um, the chances or try and reduce that, that, that bushfire risk um, to, to life. So thank you. Um, I will hand over to Chris now. Um, thank you very much. me now? Hopefully that's a yes. Um, just not yes. sure. Yes, Chris, connect. I can hear you. Good. Okay. And you could see my presentation when I just had it up? Uh, yes. How's that? Okay. It's not uh, up now. Hi, everyone. It's... No? It's not up now. Ah. Uh, okay. Bear with me. Yeah, screen. There. Okay. okay, here we go. Okay. Now that? you need to you need to put it into um yes, yeah, yeah. there it is. Great. Okay, beautiful. Uh hi everyone. I'm Chris from all the way over in WA and um we watched with horror what happened to you poor buggers on the east coast and it probably won't give you any comfort, but it's just a matter of luck that we escaped in WA uh, relatively unscathed. Our time will come. And um, my talk is really based on how we can reach a point where Australians understand the concept of firewise. I live in a state that's been, uh, had to grip, uh, grapple with drought for well over 30 years. We've got the fastest drying con uh, climate on the planet in WA. So the concept of water wise is really well understood. And people know what a water wise plant is, they know what water wise products are, and they have probably a fairly good idea of what a water wise landscape is. Part of my passion is to get people to the point where they understand fire wise landscaping, which links in so wonderfully with all the fantastic talks we've had already. So, the front cover that's an example of a fire wise garden that we installed for one of our major our local volunteer fire brigades in, in partnership with DFES over here. RCFA is DFES, Department of Fire and Emergency Services. The interesting thing about this, and you can probably see there's a 
some bush there. So it was a big A-class reserve. When they went to upgrade this building, the bowel level came back that it was FZ. So for people who don't know, that's the serious, that's the highest bowel rating. In other words, danger, bam, bam, this is a serious high fire risk. When we put our landscape in, which I'll explore in a little more detail soon, it dropped the bowel rating from FZ, which, as I said, is screaming scary, to bowel 29. So a really well-designed and managed and managed landscape, I'll keep stressing that, can make a big difference. So that's a big part of our program. The Forever Project, our tagline is to inspire and empower change. It's one thing to inform people, but we have to inspire them and empower them to make themselves more safe and resilient and this is our tagline now meet the fireys halfway you know it's not good enough for people to think the cavalry is going to come and our wonderful speakers already have said if you're thinking the cav cavalry is going to quietly calmly knock on the door during a catastrophic event and say this way ladies and gents and um, would you like a champagne on the way it's just a delusion um, in Denmark one of our far south coast regions, one of the most at-risk regions in WA and therefore probably Australia, there's four and a half thousand people and 26 fire trucks. So we say to people, you do the math, the chances of you getting this assistance is pretty small. And if you have not done enough to make your home, your home and garden defendable, well, those fireys, those brave souls during a catastrophic event will make a split second decision. Is your property worth defending or not? They're not going to risk their lives and why would they? But most people don't expect or accept that. So that's a big part of what we try and do. And this image here, which I love, again, another great example of everyone working together. So the landscape has been well designed, well maintained, and it's been beautifully saved and protected by the skilled firefighting crews, volunteer and otherwise. So, but why is this so rare? Why is it rare? And there's lots of reasons, but our program that we've developed in WA, and we hope to roll out in other parts of Australia, is really about showing how we can make a big step moving forward. And number one is accept we're at risk, accept it's our responsibility as landholders and to try and design our landscapes and manage them to reduce that risk of fire. And like everything in, in the world, there is a, 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 just a storm of information, whether it's COVID, shark attack or bushfire. So this image here, this is, this is what is out there for us all the time. Just a, 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 a white noise. A lot of it is, to be brutally honest, crap, bad information. There's some small amounts of good information, but we're just overwhelmed with a sea of information. So not surprisingly, people often feel either that they don't need to make any change or there's just too much info. They feel really like they can't make a good positive step in any direction. So the program we've developed, we have this funnel. And the idea is that we capture people through a range of initiatives and we steer them towards doing more detailed design. So they come out the other end, holding hands, very happy, and they're firewise. And that is, as I said before, accepting it's their responsibility to meet the fireys halfway, but to design and manage a more firewise landscape. And that's a big part of what we do. So there it is, there's the great uh, heaving uh, mass of people, most of which are ignorant. And if WA is anything to go by, we know that less than 8% of our population, that our at-risk population, have got anything close to a decent fire plan. Less than 8%, so less than 10% have done anything really to make their property safe and sustainable. So we clearly know the model we've used in the past is not enough. So we try and capture them with these big, loud, exciting events steering them to ever more, more detailed, more commitment, but ultimately more empowering processes where they have tailored designs for their own properties. And these are the key ingredients. Nothing new here. The home, that's the Alamo. That's the place we know that has to be there as your plan B. I hear so many people go, oh, look, I'll just leave during a fire. All right, well, that's, that's a good plan A. But what if uh, a tree has fallen over your one access point or you were caught up watching Netflix and before you knew it, there was smoke in the room and there was a fire on the horizon. It's too late to leave. Or you're at work and the 15-year-old kids are there at home during a catastrophic fire event. There's many reasons why we need to have a plan B. And that plan B is, oh my God, the house and the garden has to have been designed and is being managed to become a fire safe zone to give us the greatest chance of surviving that catastrophic event. So it's the home and it's the ember attack 
And we do a lot to try and remind people and show them what they need to do to stop those embers literally attacking their home. And then the garden. The big part of what we do is the firewise landscaping. And I'll talk about the principles of what that is fairly soon. Um, and then the broader property. I come from a land care sustainable farming background. So I've always been saying to people, you have to design your property thinking about north and then the prevailing winds and the fuel loads and all those other issues and aspects that our wonderful speakers have already talked about, which will make a big difference. And to me, when we start to design a property for fire safety, we will make it more beautiful, more productive and more sustainable and, and obviously more enjoyable and safer. So when it's well designed, you start to tackle things like weeds, you start to create better pastures. If you have forests or timbers reserves, you manage them for higher efficacy and efficiency. All of those things start to work more effectively for you when you have a good design. And again, this has been said in many different ways. I love the, the cross-section view that was shown originally. And, and it's the same thing. As you get further out from the house, there's less intense management. But what we say to people is in zone one and zone two, you are really, really careful about what you put into those spaces. So we would say to people, what are the things that are defendable that are going to assist you and the things that are not going to assist you? And we generally will say that if you do it well, you can design your landscape so the trees and shrubs that you have in there can make your house warmer in summer, sorry, warmer in winter and cooler in summer, that you can have your productive fruit trees and veggies relatively close in that zone one and zone two. They need more management for uh, productivity and they can also then be part of that fire safe zone as well. And this is some of the stuff that we do. So we're just in, in discussions with DFES, again, that's our Department of Fire and Emergency Services and our Water Corporation to partner with Bunnings to do some big events in October in the awareness, Fire Awareness Month. So we would have some big events where thousands of people go through Bunnings if they're in the hinterland of the high at-risk regions of WA. And we would be doing demonstrations on retrofitting homes and gardens to make them more fire safe. What's an example of a firewise garden? What's an example of a landscape that needs to be improved? How would we go and do it? Do it? And um, this is all about getting thousands of people aware. We do it in partnership with the boys and the girls and their beautiful red shiny fire trucks. Use it as a way to show that we're all on the same team, but you, you as landholders are an absolutely critical part of that. You need to meet the fireys halfway. And these are some of the examples of the Firewise Gardens we've begun to roll out. Uh, this was with the Shire of Denmark in the south coast of WA. And this is one of Australia's first demonstration firewise gardens. It has a range of different garden styles. There's educational signage. And for us, we really try and tick three boxes, firewise, waterwise, and wastewise. So all of the material we use is recycled construction and demolition waste. All these beautiful different colors, all of this material here is crushed up bricks, tiles, and concrete of different sizes and shapes so we can make uh, uh, an ember wise landscape. So obviously if this is well maintained, it's not gonna burn. Well, the mulch is not gonna burn. We've used fire wise plants, we have separation and we use materials that don't burn. So we've got sculptures and caught and steel containers, gabion baskets. So we're saying to people, you can have the useful gardens. They can be productive, they can be a joy. You don't have to compromise and sacrifice just because you're creating a fire wise landscape. And this is an example of what we believe can happen all across at-risk Australia, where there's a fire station or a community hall or a rec centre in an at-risk area, use it as an opportunity to create a firewise demonstration landscape where there's signage, fact sheets, where people can use that facility, see it being managed, seeing it evolve and see how they can integrate those aspects into their own landscape. And this for us are the four key themes of a firewise landscape. Number one, Obviously, you choose fire retardant plants, and Mark uh, touched on that to start with. Um, using those fire wise plants, so the ones that are less likely to burn, we use the recycled construction and demolition waste. We say to people, a lot of the hard landscaping material people use is virgin material. It has a massive environmental impact. Why not use products that will have the same impact in terms of reducing ember and ember attack, but they have much less environmental impact, 
the design. Very important, we talk about having separation vertically and horizontally between the fuels and then management. Within a year, one tonne per hectare of fine fuels are dropping on typical ecosystems in WA. So within one to two years, even the best firewise garden is going to be rendered pretty much obsolete if we don't manage them effectively. So we spend a lot of time showing people how you would manage those landscapes. And the beauty of good, heavy, strong, thick, solid mulch like this is you can use a blower at the right angle to gently blow off the fine fuels, leaving the solid rocky mulch behind. So these are techniques people need to learn about. And we've been doing this a long time. So uh, as you can see there, we've taught about 130,000 people since 92. And these are all of our Firewise products. So in other words, these are different styles of events, workshops, demonstrations that we work in partnership with local governments, community groups, NRMs, local fire brigades to put these in place to, again, inspire and empower that change that we need to see in people. And this is an example of the Firewise Garden we did at Chandicott. We have a range of different sponsors and we see this as a really powerful way of moving this forward. And into the future, we want big players like Bunnings to be having these Firewise fact sheets to be supporting us on these big days so that we can see thousands of people and help everyone in the firefighting, fire design and mitigation space recognize that people are moving towards meeting them halfway, that they're being inspired and empowered to make the kinds of landscapes that are defendable and that are ultimately going to be saving lives. And um, that's pretty much me. I've gone at machine gun pace, but that's, that's typical. Um, and I'll finish my talk off now. Thank you very much, Chris. That was fantastic. All, all three speakers were just full of, full of information. So thank you, Mark, Anthony, and Chris. Now we've got um, about 20, 25 minutes for, um, for questions. I have um, over a dozen of them here that I'll, uh, I'll work my way through if that's uh, okay. Now, um, Mark and Anthony, you can, um, uh, start your videos now if you'd like. Um, I, I have a question here um, from Donna. Are there recommended distances for the inner and outer zones for defendable spaces? We currently work on a 20 meter distance based on bushfire management plan. How does that sound? Yep, Chris is saying yes. I, sorry, the only caveat I'd say is it really depends on on the, the, the fuel loads around you. As a, as a crude rule of thumb, we say that the, the thicker and more dense the bush is, uh, then the, the wider that defendable space needs to be. So we usually say to people, it's anywhere from 10 to maybe 50 metres, depending on mm -hmm. what your bowel rate is or what you perceive to be the, the fire risk for you. Great. If I could just add to that. So uh, defendable space in as we call it in Victoria and in some other jurisdictions, it might be uh, asset protection zone or the like. It's based on um, Australian standard 3959, uh, which will provide you with the, the distances, uh, well, the vegetation classification. Um, if you look in the Victorian planning scheme, there's, there's sort of a relative table to that. So uh, for instance, if you have forest uh, vegetation, the upslope of yours or the effective slope is upslope, that would be 25 metres of space to meet the planning requirements. So um, as a guide, that it, it does come from that standard. Um, but in Victoria, just be aware that you, uh, the defendable space is, is um, commensurate to vegetation type and effective slope um, underneath that vegetation as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Robert asks, from experience, are fires more likely to travel uphill or downhill? I think we have a couple of people who have been out on the fire grounds. Is there, is there any rhyme or reason to yeah. it? Yeah, I can answer that if, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of depends, but fires will travel faster uphill and they'll fa travel faster downhill. So it is related to a combination of topography and the prevailing winds. So the head of the fire is the most dangerous. So 
depending on which way the fire is being spread by the wind. Um, that's where it's probably going to go fastest and how that interacts with fuel. It can get funneled up gullies, things like that. Um, but yes, if you um, if the hazard is downhill, um, that's the, the vegetation, if it's downhill of your property, then that's more bad news uh, than if it's the other way around um, because you'll have the fire, the fire behaviour is different. I hope that kind of answers the question in a roundabout sort of way. <laughs> okay. Um, Karen asks, are, how flammable are bamboo screens of wire and post fencing? Uh, so they're pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've um, actually been in charge of my first fire as a rural fire service was to burn a stack burn of 20 high metre bamboo and it goes off like shotguns. So, so mm. the air, air inside gets supercharged and heated and explodes and it causes all sorts of mayhem with cows nearby and they get very scared and run away. And yeah, and, and also bamboo, if you think about it, it, it when it dries, it, it has a lot of flash um, sort of papery kind of material that hangs. And, and drops off and it, it adds to quite a lot of lot of fuel um, particularly when it's when it's dried out so yeah um, but if it's being used in a material for supporting things then yeah it's not not the best to use I'd, I'd avoid it if possible okay that's pretty clear I think um, Eva asks what are your thoughts about putting sprinklers on the roofs of all the buildings Um, Chris, yeah, Chris as I said, it, it's a it's, it's a part of a um, can be part of a strategy. Um, right. I, or, but by themselves, uh, they may not be as effective. Uh, it, 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 it's not overly common. It was spoken about. You, you do need a, a, a water curtain um, over the building. The, the wind generated by by bushfires can be cyclonic um, in, right. in their strength. So, so a, a very low water mist um, can dampen it but as soon as that's impacted by those those, those winds um, mm. it, it doesn't become effective so you need a lot of water you need uh, it to be well designed um, as I said it should be part of a it could be included as part of a, a system like the whole, um, yeah yeah, as yeah said, almost, it doesn't answer if the if yeah, the, almost like a cherry, a cherry on top so you, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so if it, 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 it add to that resilience um, sure alone I, I wouldn't um, rely on them right yeah. and if i they're probably worth investigating yeah it's complicated anthony yeah um there's been a few phds done on sprinkler systems and and like mark was saying it's it gets really complicated because the wind is interacting with the the droplets and so the droplets may not be wetting down the areas that are important to be wet down and where the embers are landing um so yeah, it, it could be really, really good, but hard to rely on. Yeah, sure, and sure. you really need to, you know, use it in conjunction, just what Mark said, with other strategies. So not having the fuels next to the house in the first place, that kind of thing. Yeah, which Chris um, articulated as well. So yeah, yeah. investigate them. But yeah, butterfly sprinklers are supposed to be better. Yeah. Sorry, I've got two of you speaking. Um, Chris, when, when you had something to say. Oh yeah, um, a lot of people will think the main thing is that uh, the water needs to be thrown on the roof. And you think unless you've got shingles, as in the roof is made of shingles, most of the time it's probably tiles or colour bonds. So that's not the bit that's going to burn. The, the sprinkler system, and uh, Mark talked about it in terms of design. So the water needs to be directed under the eaves. So you're really looking fat drops to drench the areas where fine fuels would normally land. So we say to people, wherever your fine fuels would naturally congregate just in normal times. That's where the embers are going to come to. So mm. making sure that the water is flooding the wooden decking, the, the, the wood box, the, the dog bed, all those sort of places, because it's not the tin roof that's going to burn and obviously filling the gutters. But if it's not designed properly and even having good metal covers over the pump, because if the Embers are landing at the pump and then that gets burnt while the whole thing's compromised. So there's a lot to think about. And I think that's what Anthony and Mark were really saying that it's, there's not a one size fits all and it is definitely not the, the be all and end all. It has to be seen as part of an integrated system. Sure, that, that is clear. 
Um, Kate says, is, asks, is there an opportunity to work with authorities to distinguish between fire retardant vegetation and non-fire retardant vegetation? In the bushfire mm -hmm. management plan the CFA prescribed for us, it simply refers to vegetation and its proximity mm -hmm. to the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll Who? just on that okay. side the, Mark? the uh, because I didn't have to, to say um, they're the requirements of the of the planning scheme. So w while they're everything you know might be site specific and there, there might be opportunity to to tailor um, some some um, those requirements, it, it's a it's a requirement of the um, effectively of council. Um, not not CFA. So there, there may be scope. It depends on on, on on a whole range of things of the, your site or what you're proposing. Um, but it's it's always something that, that, that could be discussed. Um, Anthony probably has a, a lot more um, information on what is flammable and what's. <laughs> Sorry, I'm put, put you in. Yeah, I guess I guess there's landscaping and species. So that's one thing. They might have been referring to communities, like vegetation communities too. I'm, I'm not 100 sure. So there's some vegetation communities which are more flammable uh, than others, um, just due to their structural and floristic composition. So it means the species that are involved and the way the the forest is structured. So rainforests, for instance, um, tend not to dry out as much because they have a closed canopy, and the wind speed is also reduced within the tree bowl as well. So all those sorts of things actually make um, some forests less flammable than others. Um, but it's important to bear in mind as well that under severe drought conditions, even the, the least flammable vegetation can burn. Um, it may not burn as severely um, as some other forests, and it depends on what part of the fire is interacting with that vegetation too. So if the head fire is burning through it, then it's gonna burn more severely, as opposed to the back of the fire or the flanks. Um, it's positioned in the topography, it, lots of different things than the, the fire weather at the time too. Mm. It gets complicated. It depends. I think it, again, needs to be seen as part of the whole system. Yes, yeah, and, and a bushfire practitioner would, would assess all those different factors and advise accordingly. Sure. We'll move on and to another question. If, oh, sorry, Chris. If I could, uh, yeah, it's when I mentioned at the beginning, Australia needs to be, um, at, at a much more sophisticated uh, understanding of firewise, you can go into a, a garden centre now and find plants that have got waterwise labelling on them, but there's nothing that says firewise, and and people desperately need this information. And we often get kickback people saying, "Oh, well, you can't do that because what if? What if?" The trouble is, people are going to, if you don't help them, then they're just going to make their own decisions, and generally not as good. So. I always point people towards the CFA publication on um, bushfire landscape design. I think it's a fabulous book. Um, I published the book two years ago, uh, A Place in the Country, and there's a big chapter. Chapter four is all about firewise landscapes and choosing the right plants. We just say the caveat is all bets are off that if you don't manage those fire retardant plants, then yeah, they're not going to be fire wise. You have to be continually managing them and, and keep in mind those principles of separation. So mm -hmm. that's absolutely critical. So fuel loads are not building up underneath or weeds that you're keeping them pruned of dead branches, but they carefully chosen to be a really powerful part of what can help you create a, a more resilient landscape. It would be a great idea, Chris, for you to put uh, the... Um the links to those two, two books in uh, e either, well, put it in the chat and, and we'll make sure that it gets onto the, into the toolkit itself. Mm -hmm. Reference mm -hmm. those. Yeah. Um, um, this, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, Mark, um, uh, you, 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 Vix, you, you're the guys that have that CFA publication. You know, the one I'm referring to. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. It's a, Did yeah, you put a fabulous. That it sounds like a, a good resource for every community to have. Um, this this is a related, but it's specific. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's tongue in cheek or not. Should I dig up my native plants and put in fruit trees? Uh, 
Depends. Is there any where you're putting them <laughs> away from yeah, the house? Exactly. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, fruit trees can often be fine. Um, some are probably a bit more fun while it's like a banana is pretty water filled um if you especially if you take off the the dead little bits it gets um i have had stories of citrus orchards going up in flames pretty easy because they got a lot of oil in them um again if you keep things watered well if you've got water to um keep the 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 live fuel moisture content high that helps a lot but again just keeping the separation as well um you can do things by trimming up you know um like chris was saying that the dead uh, branches is good management um, garden management is always going to going to help and just being careful about where you position things so you don't have to dig up all your natives necessarily um, and do both have 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 a nat bit native and fruit trees too you've got to enjoy it go ahead chris oh, i was just going to say uh, anthony had a great photo of the landscape where it was a remnant eucalypts there and it was fire flammable it was probably a eucalyptus grandis something like that um but they had fantastic fuel load separation so we we are at pains to say to people where you can keep your beautiful remnant trees they're very important in the landscape but accept that they are a risk and therefore you manage them so we talk about canopy thinning so removing some of those weaker or diseased or competing limbs. Remember the boys were talking about strong cyclonic winds during firestorm events. So if your canopy of your plants are more open because you've done good canopy thinning, that opens the canopy, it's less likely to blow and be damaged and snap and therefore cause issues into the future. And at the base of those plants, you may need to sacrifice the shrubs if it had existing bushland and put maybe stone and gravel underneath and some succulents so you are retaining your beautiful trees as long as they're not overhanging the tree uh, the house I should say of course you're keeping those limbs back but there is an opportunity for keeping some of those remnants the canopies are not touching they're not overhanging the gutters etc and you've removed the fuel load separation and any ladders that would be which is the ribbony bark which would allow the embers to get up i say you know fire is lazy if we have this tangle of dry connected info uh, plants vegetation then that makes it so much easier for fire but all those vertical and horizontal separations make it so much harder for the embers it slows it down giving the fireies and you a chance to defend oh great <laughs> great response um here's a, a question that um that kind of stretches it out beyond some of our, oh, Anthony, you were talking about small blocks. Um, Eva asks, landscape design will depend very much on what your neighbors are doing, surely. So if for those of us who live on very small blocks, we can do so much on our property and, and then it's a community effort, isn't it? That can certainly help if you're, if you're collectively doing the right thing together, that's gonna help a lot. Um, it shouldn't put people off not doing what they can on their properties though as well. Um, but if you're concerned that the neighbors may be doing the right thing, maybe have a chat to them and educate them a little bit um, and that may help. But yeah, uh, having um, like the color bond fence and non-combustible fences between in that situation is probably probably quite valuable, I'd say, because it's putting a, a direct barrier and shield to what the neighbor you know, may or may not be doing as well. So yeah. It, it, it is, it could be an issue. Indeed. Um, Duncan asked the question, how does the cost of firewise mulch, uh, for instance, recycled concrete compared to common mm. pine chip mulch? Chris? Yeah, the, 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 yeah, it's a great question. The tyranny of distance is always the issue. The, the, the product itself, because it's recycled, uh, is generally cheaper but it's the tyranny of distance to actually um, move it around. Um, I guess the thing I'd say is that once that stone mulch is there, it's there forever. So whereas pine bark, you have to top that up probably once, at least once a year. So within two to three years, even if the product was more expensive, it will pay for itself because yeah, it's just going to never break down and therefore you don't have anywhere near the upkeep costs. And I, my only advice again is we generally say anything above 35 mil size. So that sort of size means that you can use the blower at just the right angle. So it's not too steep with the blow and the, 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 the blow 
wind on lighter angle you can gently push off the fine fuels and leave your stone mulch relatively intact because anyone who's tried to separate fine fuels from woody mulch will know it's almost impossible um, so there's some real advantages if it's done well Great, thank you. Um, Emily asked a question, it, can any of you let us know if there are regional guides for plants that reduce fire risk in all areas across Australia? Are there mm. such resources? Yeah, th th there are. So the fire authorities publish different ones. Sometimes planning schemes have, in their landscape policies, have um, lists of suitable species as well. So they're two good space, um, places to look. Um, yeah, have a, have a bit of a Google search, but um, yeah, those are two good resources. There's an excellent book by um, Caird Ramsey as well, Landscaping in Bushfire Prone Areas, which um, you can purchase and it has a lot of principles which are espoused in there, which are really beneficial. But when you understand the, the principles, then you can um, um, look at a plant and sort of understand what may or may not, may not be good too. Um, there's a few academic papers, but there's one couple by Malcolm Gill, um, worth looking at too, where he put them in ovens and see how quickly they burn, that kind of thing. So yeah, there's a few resources out there. Great. Mm. What? Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to say, Anthony, can you repeat that first uh, book that you said? Mm. Uh, Cad Ramsey and Rudolph. Oh, I have to grab it. Maybe. Building uh, landscaping in bushfire prone areas. It's, it's about 15 years old, but it's excellent. Some of the pictures in my slides were from that book. If you oh, okay. could um, put that reference to uh, renew, I'll put sure. it in yep. the talk. That'd be wonderful. Yep. Yeah. Um, now, let me see what else have we got. Um, oh, how was the 10,000 liter amount determined for firefighting? Did Black Summer change that given the amount of communities that, that experienced multiple times a fire can come back and burn? Many people ran out of water. No, um, Mark. Oh, oh it, it's a really common question. Um, the 10,000 is one of those things that sort of was established a long time ago and um, in Victoria, that is. Um, ours, our requirement in, in Victoria is based on your land size. So the, the sort of the, the underlying assumption is the bigger your land, uh, the more water you need. And at 10, Anything below 10,000 litres, so for us it's 2,500 and 5,000 litres, you don't need authority access. So that's solely for, for the occupant use. Um, at 10,000, the, the, our, our trucks will generally carry two to 3,000 litres. That will give us um, three um, uh, truck loads of water um, and, and, and a, bit in, a little bit in reserve. So it, it's probably not enough, as I, as I suggested. It probably could be seen as the minimum you would need. Um, and it might be adequate, it absolutely might be adequate in, in, in many areas. Um, but in those more remote rural um, areas, it, it might not be. So you would need to consider that. Um, I, I haven't seen the, the most recent recommendations um, from the, the uh, Black Summer Royal Commission, um, the Black Saturday Royal Commission in, for Victoria. Uh, again, spoke to having an adequate water supply, which is what the, the wording used to be. Um, that was reinforced in the, the building regulations where they also said 10,000 litres. Um, where, it, the original question, where it came from specifically, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but it, it, it does, it would, as I said, it, you, you should consider your own situation um, and requirements, um, or potential um, for requirements, as I mentioned. You can be cut off. Um, we found in, in over the year, and especially in 2020, uh, over, over um, Black Summer, that fire can come back. Um, and from my own experience, I saw grassland burn with the same high intensity three times um, in the space of a few hours, um, which was I, I haven't seen before. So it, 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 it can get um, it, it can get quite uh, intense. You, you you might need quite a lot of water there. So. Um, 10,000 is usually adequate, but always adjust to uh, suit your, your, that landscape risk that you have. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure about 
well, I'll, I'll read this question and see what, what you say. Um, Donna says, watching the rebuild of fire affected properties, I'm disappointed by the attitude to bell ratings and the landscaping and replacement dwellings. Um, should more legal, whoops, it's gone away. Should more legal emphasis be placed on building for fire protection and protecting surrounding properties? So is this, is this outside your scope? Thank you. It, uh, I think... Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I, I, I might not make friends here, but I think we're really still in the wild west when it comes to really good um, assessments. Um, I think a lot of, we don't have many ball assessors in WA, which blows me away. Uh, when you think of the, the massive problem that we have, and those that are there are generally not ecologists. There's two that I work with, um, Rowan Kaboon and um, Kath Kinnear from Biodiverse Solutions who are very passionate about getting that balance right. But a lot of the design as well will just get rid of the vegetation. And it's kind of the, the low hanging fruit, it's the easy way out and it's not designing safe, sustainable landscapes. And that's really the middle line we're trying to take is that you know, we don't have to sacrifice and compromise to be able to have a safe and beautiful and productive landscape. So I really think that it's that whole maturity of the system. It's really not quite there yet. And more needs to be done to make sure that there's that strong integration between the design and also fitting it in with the ecosystems that are there. Thank you. That's that sounds like a great um, final comment from you, Chris. I think we're we're at twenty six four minutes to to go, and I'm thinking rather than take any more questions, and I think maybe some of these questions can can move to uh, something perhaps in the in the toolkit that we can we can work with. We'll just see see whether we can hold these questions um, or elsewhere. But I I'm I'm like. I'd like to ask you, Mark and, and Anthony, just a, a final comment before I go into the last two slides for the, the webinar. Um, any, any final words for the... Uh... Yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess just to remember the, the main bushfire attack mechanisms and have a think about where the fire is most likely to come from in your particular situation. So you got the direct flame contact, the heat, and, and the embers, and then how those embers could ignite things in and around the house and how you can arrange that landscape or that fuel so it has less attack on, on, on your important assets like your, your house. So think of secondary fires that could be started uh, by embers, which are burning gardens and how you could arrange that so they're separated from, from your, um, your asset that you're trying to protect. Right, yeah, good thought. Mark? Any last words? Yeah, so I'm saying, I'm saying that, um, that that resilience is, is, is a system that all relies on each other. Um, if you're about, it's got to be site specific. Uh, it's got to be specific to your risk. So there isn't a one size uh, fits all solution. Um, there, there could be many. I like to think of it as, um, especially when we're talking, I think it was Donna mentioned um, the, the construction standard, Bell construction standard. That you can just with energy ratings, you can have a really poorly designed house, um, but you can still achieve a six star energy rating. Or you can have a really well designed house that doesn't rely on all the insulation and the heating and all those, those, those moving parts that a, a poorly designed house needs to achieve the same, um, same level. Uh, and we can do the same with, with bushfire design if it's, if it's well designed, well landscaped. Um, and has been thought about to be as resilient as possible and as robust as possible. If one of those elements falls over, so if, if fire gets closer than it should, you might not have the worst case scenario. Uh, if it's poorly designed, you, you, your, your opportunity and chances uh, reduce. So, um, yeah, that'd be my, my, my comment. Yeah, I, I think that what I'm hearing is that it really, we have a, an ongoing responsibility and to be mindful of, of our circumstance and um, be mindful and respond to it, I guess. So that management that Chris talks about or, or seeing the system that, uh, that puts the pieces to, together. And so I thank you all very, very much. And I think the, the 
people that are, are participating have found this a very, very um, rewarding time to uh, um, and very informative. So thank you all three. Um, I'm, I'm going to go now just to a last couple of slides. Um, and here we are. Uh, there's a reminder about an upcoming um, event, which is happening in July. A series of speed data uh, sustainability expert events will be held as part of this project. These events will provide the opportunity for people who are rebuilding to sit down with experts, designers, and builders to discuss their plans one-on-one. -on -one. Starting in July, bookings for these events will open soon. People rebuilding will be given preference. And the last slide is a reminder about tomorrow night, we have the final webinar in this series. And it is retrofitting for fire resilience. So it's really combining some of perhaps what we've learned tonight about landscaping and what we can do with the homes that we're living in right now for fire resilience. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope we'll see you again tomorrow and our webinar will now close.